Hi, it's Dwyer. It is Monday, July 13th, 2020. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk boxing. Let's talk some risks involved in analyzing a fighter. Things that you might know, things that no one might know, at least not publicly. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now on this YouTube site, we try to make predictions on boxing matches. And often there's a lot of information that's not public, right? With a nod to one of my favorite authors, the author of Fooled by Randomness, in my opinion, still his best book, Nassim Taleb, right, the person who popularized the term black swan. Let's talk about tail risks in boxing. By that I mean risks at the margin that are very important that we might not know enough about, that you're going to have to make a decision on as you're analyzing a fighter's chances of winning a match. Right? What I'm going to do is mention the risk. From time to time, I'll mention some fighters who fall in the category. Some of this information might surprise some people. Some might not. The first risk are vision problems. Right? The mainstream press, they cover a lot of stuff, but they miss a lot of stuff. We now know Right? The fighter himself admitted it. That for several years of his career, including his fights against Muhammad Ali, Joe Fraser was blind in one eye. He actually suffered the injury, according to him, in training. He understood that if he ever admitted to being blind in one eye, he wouldn't be granted a boxing license. So, he and his handlers figured out a way to be examined by a friendly doctor so that he would be able to pass his medical exams. So that takes us to the thriller in Manila. Understand, Ali puffs up Joe's good eye. When Eddie Fudge stops the fight and claims that Joe is blind, Joe is blind. He's going off shadows at that point, right? Another fighter who had vision problems, in fact, he admits to going into a fight wearing a contact lens in one eye was Larry Holmes, right? Harry Grepp, famous fighter, died and then during his autopsy, they found out that he was blind in one eye. We speculate that he lost vision in the eye in the Kid Norfolk fight, right? Norfolk, of course, is a boxing hall of famer. But just understand, these guys were fighting with less than perfect vision. In the cases of Fraser and Grab, they were literally blind in one eye. Larry Holmes, late in his career, had such vision problems that he wears a contact lens. And this information was not publicly reported. If you're watching a fighter and you notice that he can't see the right hand, so he can't see a left hook, and if you notice this pattern in fight after fight, don't assume that if the fighter has a vision problem, that it's going to be public. Right? Understand, some of these guys have blind spots. They make a living getting hit. They don't want to lose the right to make a living. Let's talk about other problems. You see a fighter, he has the world on a string. He has it all together. This falls into my category of talented but not committed. If the fighter 
doesn't follow through on the promise, and then you're finding out that the fighter's a man about town, has problems training, is frequently seen at the club. You're hearing stories about the guy out late at night. Let me just say, I haven't seen too many fighters more talented than young Hector Camacho. Dazzling hand speed. When he fights Bazooka Lamon, Ray Leonard is actually one of the TV commentators. Ray Leonard is dazzled by Camacho's hand speed. Right, this was a guy who owned New York City and he knew it. Of course, Hector Camacho was out late at night. Hector Camacho wasn't as committed as some others in the sport. Let's name another guy, current fighter, who's talented but who might not be committed, Andy Ruiz. I'm not kidding when I say Andy Ruiz has the fastest hands in the heavyweight division. Let's go further. Andy has some of the fastest hands I've ever seen in the heavyweight division. He's really blessed. And folks, he throws combinations. It's not a tap. He's not sacrificing power for the hand speed. The Demetrenko fight is classic. Andy's hitting hard. And he's simply too fast. This is the fight that Andy Ruiz has before his first Anthony Joshua fight. You understood that Andy Ruiz is much faster. He's much more blessed with hand speed than someone like Anthony Joshua. You also understood that Andy Ruiz is a combination puncher. So he can naturally throw off five and six punch combinations. But you also understand that he has critics, including his former trainer, Abel Sanchez. There's a group of people out there who say, look, Andy just doesn't train hard enough, just doesn't take the sport seriously enough. Right? When you're watching Andy, you're really going to have to ask yourself the question, not of whether Andy's talented enough to beat anybody at the heavyweight division, quite frankly, if he's able to get in a pocket, right? The question really is, is Andy going to be motivated enough to keep himself in shape? Understand, this is a fighter who gained weight between his first Anthony Joshua fight and his second Anthony Joshua fight. And let's just say the weight he gained was not muscle. Let's talk about another risk. I call this committed but not talented, right? These fighters tend to be KO punchers who can't move or defend themselves, but who have just enough, and I mean just enough, to get into the contender ranks. In other words, they'll be club fighters, but they're not world class, right? Let me say this too, life's unfair. Sometimes the fighter who's committed but not talented is the last person to know that they're not talented, right? The people around them have a conflict of interest. They want to make money off the fighter. They want this guy to risk his health going further in his career, right? They're pushing the fighter. They're hoping, since the guy's a KO puncher, they're hoping the guy lands that Sunday punch, beats a better fighter, a more skilled fighter, and gets to the next level so they could then get the big money at the end of the rainbow. As you're watching fighters like this, just ask yourself, what defensive skills does the guy have? I'm just telling you, if you don't have decent defense, you're not going to make it at the world-class ranks. If the guy is getting hit with too many punches, I don't care how good his offense looks. If the guy is getting hit with too many punches, and if the guy isn't a physical freak who 
has a lot of length, who's hard to find. If the guy's there hoping to get by on effort, that's not a guy you can back against a skilled opponent. Right? You can't back an untalented guy against a talented guy who might not be committed, but who still has the talent advantage, the faster hands, the better defense, the better reflexes. Let's talk about another tail risk, the PED junkies. These are fighters who fail more than one PED test or who you suspect are living a performance enhanced supplement lifestyle, right? Let's name one, Tommy Morrison, right? If you looked at Tommy Morrison's body back in the day, it suddenly started to get too cut up, right? Morrison was a guy who had some baby fat on him. Then suddenly you noticed the baby fat started to disappear and Morrison was just too cut up. Now we're finding out that Tommy Morrison was injecting himself with performance enhancing drugs. Understand a huge portion of the Tommy Morrison story was fake, right? He fights guys like George Foreman. He's in huge fights, Ray Mercer. He's fighting huge matches against former heavyweight champs or future heavyweight champs. But understand the way he was doing it was by injecting himself, going through a drug regimen. Right? We know about it now because Tommy claims he caught HIV from sharing a needle at a gym. That's how brazen the guy was. He's not only using drugs, he's sharing needles with other people. Right? If you're looking at a guy and you're looking at film and suddenly the guy has no baby fat on him. And if you're thinking about the guy's age and the guy somehow is losing all this baby fat well into his 20s. You look at the guy's amateur record and it's not that glistening. You wonder where the guy suddenly has been able to improve himself physically to the extent that he has. Right? Also, when I'm speculating, and that's what it is in looking at fighters, when I'm speculating on whether a guy is juicing, I've noticed that the guys who I think are juicing, maybe it's just muscle mass, they tend to run out of gas somewhere around the fifth or sixth rounds of fights. Now, don't get me wrong, they'll get a second win sometimes, but you look at a guy a little bit too much musculature. You have the YouTube video library at your disposal. You go on YouTube and the guy has a lot of baby fat and stuff, which somehow, within the last year, he's mysteriously lost. Then you're watching him fight and you notice the guy physically just fall off a cliff. I'm just telling you, guys who are natural, don't fall off a cliff in the middle of fights, like guys who are juicing. Let me also say too, if the guy fails a PED test, you're gonna hear excuses. You're gonna hear a pre-planned story, right? These guys set it up so they have plausible deniability. They know the supplements that they can blame for being tainted. Right? Another group that falls into this category are the fighters who look like they're running out of gas in their careers and then suddenly look rejuvenated. Right? Lucien Boutte look to me to be slowing down. Let's just say I don't know whether Boutte juiced or not, but I was not surprised when Boutte, later in his career, failed a drug test. You know, this gardener always seems to wait for me to start a video, doesn't he? 
Let's also talk about another fighter. You saw these fighters really during the 80s and 90s. These aren't PED junkie fighters. These are just junkie fighters. These are the fighters who have problems with cocaine, right? Sometimes alcohol. Word of advice, if you hear a guy has failed a cocaine test, I'm not sure if that's the guy you ever want to bet on, right? The next risk, and these are fighters I try to catch at the right time because you see the talent. You know it's there, but you also understand the risk involved. We'll call these high variance fighters, right? Let me just ask you a simple question here. How many future or former heavyweight champions did Buster Douglas beat? Right? Most of the public knows of one. A dominant champ, Mike Tyson. Buster Douglas gives Tyson his first loss. Buster Douglas drops Tyson. You remember Tyson being on the canvas, reaching for his mouthpiece. Right? The narrative is that Buster Douglas got lucky. This was the night of his life. Right? Buster was well out of his league. He was more than a 30 to 1 underdog. Right? One of the biggest underdogs to win a fight in boxing history. But who is Buster Douglas? Understand, the folklore is a little bit off. Buster Douglas beat former heavyweight champion Trevor Burbeck. Buster Douglas beat future heavyweight champion Oliver McCall. You might recall McCall is the guy who first beats Lennox Lewis. Right? You look at the Buster Douglas record and you realize this guy, some nights, was inspired. He beats at least three guys during his career, who during their careers held a heavyweight title. But yet he had enough uninspiring nights where we don't consider him a boxing great. His performance against Evander Holyfield where he hits the canvas, is he unconscious or not? Does he want to hold his title or not? He wipes his nose, looks at his glove. This is while he's on the canvas. This is while the count's taking place. And then he decides to stay on the canvas. After all, he was making several million dollars for the fight. He no longer needed the money. Right? Well, just understand, if you can spot a high-variance fighter like a Buster Douglas, then when he is a big underdog against a fighter like a Mike Tyson, you'll understand, look, this guy is worth at least a play on the over in the fight. Even if you don't believe he's going to win the fight, you understand the public's undervaluing him. Let's talk about another guy, and this guy is a boxing great. But wow, we had some uninspiring nights. James lights out Tony. Understand he beats an unbeaten Michael Nunn in Nunn's backyard to win the middleweight title. Did you know that he fought Mike McCallum, great fighter, like not three times? Did you know that Tony wins two of the three and gets a draw in the third fight? Think about that. You know, he beats Vasily Giroff for the IBF Cruiserweight title, classic fight. Tony on his game. He then KOs Evander Holofield in a heavyweight match in his very next fight. Two fights later, his coup de grace, he beats John Ruiz, the same John Ruiz that Roy Jones beat for the heavyweight title. James Tony beats for the heavyweight title, only to be stripped after the fact for PEDs. Well, let me just say, maybe that's the problem. Tony had weight problems. 
You know, Tony failed a drug test. He also lost twice to Montel Griffin. He lost twice to Sam Peter. He got a gift decision against David Tiberi. I'd love for anyone watching this video to look at that fight and tell me Tony won that fight. He lost badly to Roy Jones Jr. So when you're dealing with the James Tony, you really have to look at his weight. You really have to see how he's doing, how focused he is before a fight. You also have to realize that this is a guy who can beat a Michael Nunn or a Mike McCallum or an Evander Holofield <laughs> on a given night, right? High variance fighters, you want to find them, you want to track them. When the opportunity presents itself, you want to bet on them. Let's talk about another tail risk factor that people need to consider. Injuries. I was at a great place. It's closed now. Hooters in Campbell, California. <laughs> One of the best venues that I've watched a fight, right? And I had made a video. I picked Sergio Martinez one of history's more underrated fighters, in my opinion. I thought this guy was much better than advertised. I picked Sergio Martinez over a fighter I thought he could beat handily, Miguel Cotto. So I show up at the bar, and of course they're Cotto fans. <laughs> Including one guy who was, you know, up in my face, he, you know, he was friendly, but, you know, I didn't realize that I was going to Kodo country, right? I thought the crowd would be neutral. Well, to make a long story short, and by the way, that Hooters is closed, it's no longer with us, and that's a shame, that's a big loss. But to make a long story short, I had known that Sergio Martinez hurt his knee late in his masterpiece performance over Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., right? That's a masterpiece until the 12th round, where Martinez gets a little sloppy, uh, just like Tyson Fury did his 12th round against Deontay Wilder, their first fight, gets caught and goes down, right? The problem is that more than Martinez, his pride was hurt. His knee was hurt. So I was a sucker. Because Martinez gave several interviews where he said, man, my knee's okay. Come on now, you know. He said, hey, I feel 100%. I have no excuses. I'm looking forward to the Cotto fight. So I thought, okay, look, I, Sergio Martinez knows better than anybody as to whether or not his knee is back, right? Well, you know the rest. The knee wasn't back. Don't believe fighters trying to sell tickets. Don't believe fighters who are filled with bravado talking up themselves before a fight. So Martinez, in a fight that I believe prime Sergio Martinez would win, right? I, I considered Martinez to be a great fighter. Martinez is in the ring on one leg against a Miguel Cotto who's moving around the ring. I think Cotto had gotten with Freddie Roach by that point, and Cotto was ready and sudden. Now understand, Sergio Martinez had great legs when healthy. He had one leg that night. I had to deal with a dominant Cotto performance <laughs> and an aggressive Cotto fan club as I tried to watch the fight, right? I remember one guy tapping me on the shoulder from time to time and saying, what's happening as Cotto was battering my fighter? Well, you have fighters with problems that they haven't discussed with the public that they had for several fights, right? They'll admit to the public that they had the problem after they've had surgery to repair it. 
So, just like Ben Roethlisberger is now telling reporters, this is the first time in several years that I've been able to throw the football without pain. After his shoulder surgery, understand Andre Ward's right shoulder was a problem for him for several years, several fights, right? Who knows what really was the deal with Manny Pacquiao's alleged shoulder problem for the Floyd Mayweather fight? What I could tell you is that we didn't hear about the shoulder problem until the last minute. Right? Didn't hear about it. Manny was supposed to be healthy, wasn't he? Freddie Roach and Manny to this day want to get Floyd Mayweather back in the ring. They claim Manny wasn't 100%. Well, when you were placing bets, they didn't tell us he wasn't 100%, did they? Another issue, Floyd Mayweather's hand problems. I remember Floyd dominating a fight. He had reconciled with his father. Floyd was dominating the fight. Understand, Mayweather ends his career, I believe, with a greater than 50% KO ratio. Young Mayweather was stopping guys, not outpointing them. He then starts fighting where the fight's going rounds. Right? I remember he's dominating a fighter. He hits the guy, you see him wincing. He walks back to the corner, his father says to him, the hands, right? The hands. And Floyd just nods his head. Well, if you're a better who bets over-unders, you need to know that. If Floyd's hands are too tender for him to get the stoppage, <laughs> you want to take the over in a fight, not the under. But of course, the Mayweather crowd was always going to tell you, oh, Floyd's hands are fine. Right? It was up to you to look at Floyd's fights and realize, you know, Mayweather has that right hand open all day and he's not throwing it. Maybe something's wrong with Floyd's hand. Or maybe Floyd is pot shotting here instead of doubling and tripling up on the punch because his hand is tender. Right? Injuries are a tail risk in boxing. Let's talk about two more tail risks. I see the video's gone 28 minutes. Money problems. Folks, this matters. Fighters who have big tax problems. Think Joe Lewis. Right? End up coming back and fighting too long. Against the wrong kind of opponents. Think Joe Lewis coming back to fight Ezra Charles. <laughs> to fight Rocky Barciano. You think it's about, you know, skill versus skill or will versus skill. When it's actually about trying to get paid, being in the ring, whether you want to be or not. To feed your family and to get rid of some debts. Again, tax problems, they're too many to mention. Right? Too many to mention. So, when you find out that the fighter has money problems, it could be a tax issue, it could be a management issue. Right? Then you need to consider that in what you're doing. Rocky Marciano retired unbeaten. One of the reasons he did, quite frankly, was because his manager was entitled to something like 50% of his purses. So Marciano insisted on getting paid in cash for his appearances. Marciano would be walking around with thousands of dollars of cash on him. He didn't want to get paid by check. 
because there'd be a written record of it. And he might have to give some money to some people. Right? Understand, money problems, management problems, lead people to situations they don't want to be in. When you hear about a fighter who has multiple kids with multiple women, who might be behind on his child support, the guy could look like he's worth a million bucks. The guy could have a career where you're looking at the high level, high grossing fights. And that guy might be close to bankruptcy in need of a payday. And so he's hopping in the ring with young lions who if he didn't need the money, he wouldn't be putting himself at risk. Betting's about risk management. If a fighter's taking on undue risk, you need to think about that in assessing his chances of winning and whether you can profit betting off of him. Understand, in these situations, because the fight's not about passion, because the fighter is coming back, not because he needs to know that he could beat this young guy, but because he has to pay Uncle Sam or Baby Mama number five, right? Or Joe Manager or Bobby Promoter. He needs to pay back that advance he got. Right? Because the fight is really a money-making exercise, that older fighter might not have the motivation. Right? That older fighter might not have that drive to win the fight if it's highly contested. Right? Same thing applies to for young fighters who need the money. They're broke. Something's happened. Maybe they're a father now, right? Maybe someone in the family needs surgery, right? We've had fighters who have had sick parents. I know to many people it doesn't matter. I actually try to keep track of some of that, right? Because to me, a fighter who hops in the ring to help dad pay for that dialysis might not be ready for the fight, might need the fight for financial reasons, but might not be ready to win the fight, and you're betting on who wins the fight. Finally, let's talk about a category that matters. And I know we don't talk about it enough. Sometimes the fighter is personality problems. Right? These fighters are in bubbles. The guy could be a great fighter, but be a dysfunctional. One of the best middleweights in history was Carlos Monzon, right? I want people to research his background, right? Understand, fighters with personality problems who just can't get it right. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., for example, right? Seems to clash with trainers clashes with promoters, is not supposed to have trained for his fight against Sergio Martinez. And understand, as I've said before, I view Martinez as a great fighter. If Chavez Jr. was about legacy, that would certainly be a legacy fight that he would want to prepare for. Right? You get the feeling that he's a guy who's just lost. There are others like him. Right? There doesn't seem to be a method to the madness. He fights Canelo. Now understand, there was a time when Chavez Jr. was highly skilled. Right? He's able to go the distance with Canelo, which is more than I can say for people like Kovalev, for example, or Rocky Fielding. But you understand that Chavez Jr., something's going on there. So they agree to a weight that really prevented Chavez Jr. from having any chance of winning that fight. 
Round after round, you're looking at him thinking, man, this guy could use some food. You know, you almost wanted them to stop the fight so his corner could give him a meal. He's lethargic. He looks terrible. You know, you're, you're wondering how the guy could let his career waste like this. I remember I um, saw him fight against Andres Fonfaro. And I knew Fonfaro was one of these up-and-coming fighters. He was going to be a tough match. And you thought, okay, well, Chavez Jr. is going to have to be prepared for this. And, of course, he wasn't prepared. Right? Some part of the elevator wasn't hitting the top floor. Let me say this, too. He fights Andy Lee. Andy Lee, at the time, was trained by Emmanuel Stewart. Understand, Stewart was one of these guys who was hesitant to criticize an opponent. Stewart was old school. You know, boxing has a wing where everyone tries to be respectful. You know, uh, even if you think the other guy is cutting corners, you, you know, approach the sport and give it the dignity um, that the sport has had for so many and providing for their families and stuff like that. Um, Chavez Jr. was supposed to take a drug test after the fight. Understand, he was so talented he beats Andy Lee. Of course, he doesn't take the drug test, or rather, the protocol is not followed to the point where Emmanuel Stewart was disgusted. It's one of the few times in Emmanuel Stewart's career where he had less than complimentary things to say about an opponent. Right? Some of these guys with personality problems, with a bit of narcissism, a lack of perspective, you can't be confident that the guy knows that the fight he's about to have is a legacy fight. You can't be confident in believing that the guy understands that his win is going to be judged by the efficacy of his agreed-upon post-fight drug test. Right? When you find a guy who just doesn't get it, Right? Just doesn't get it. You need to be afraid to bet on the guy, even when the guy is talented. Right? Carlos Monzon was a beast in the ring. Dominant middleweight is one of the absolute best to ever be in the division. Right? The bottom line is outside the ring, the guy was a mess. Right? He ends up in prison. He ends up dying early. Right? My point to you is be aware of the risk in picking a fighter like that. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. If there are other tail risks that you consider in betting on fights, let's hear about them in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.